Okay, welcome back. And uh, yes, we shall continue on with um, what we were looking at. We were looking at what makes a good husband and wife team. Uh, we, we did refer to the first initial three points. We're going to keep going ahead. Um, we, we were looking at what makes a good husband and team. The fourth point that talks uh, is what, what really talks about is how, um, when, you know, each of us as individuals have our own strengths. We have our probably our uh, certain interests, but when we can share some of these interests and pursue some things that are common, uh, whatever it may be, it could be to do with um, maybe uh, uh, an intellectual pursuit, some kind of project or activity that you would want to do together, or it can even be, uh, you know, learning God's word together, ministering together, um, going together to some form of a place where you can minister. When you share these common interests, doing things common, even, you know, simple things like uh, maybe playing a game together, um, cooking together, all of this uh, builds a team in a greater point, a position, right? Even, even when the team together, uh, as, as you're working together, each person becomes a good player uh, in the team rather than becoming these individual contributors. Because when you work together instead of independently, you will find that many things multiply, right? And it can be um, in, in your work area, it can be in the spiritual area, it can be emotional, it can be intellectual, rather than doing things independently, working together as a team. When you work together as a team player, you know that you will, you, the communication gets better, uh, decision-making gets better. Working together as a team opens you up to probably certain criticisms as well, but being willing to accept those criticisms without feeling um, as if the other person is out to harm or out to uh, belittle you, but taking it as an encouragement or taking it as a sense of growth. So you would see that, you know, when you work together in a team, there is one person who sees something that isn't working well, that's helping the team. When it's being called out and taken well and not with criticism, it is definitely helps the team at, at a larger larger um, place or a large, there is a larger impact in it. So being willing to take on those criticisms is another uh, way of how you show that you work together as a team. Also, uh, not defending your own ideas, but being willing to sort those ideas out so that there can be a better understanding together. All right. Um, when you when you are together as a team player, what you are also committing to do is able to take on your share of what uh, of of the load or your part of the load is something that you are going to be willing to take up. So um, you know, and that's that's actually quite. This is so essential. Even you know, as you start in marriage, to be able to establish this you know, who carries what part of the load together, the more in, uh, frequently that this gets established, the greater the team works. For example, let's say a husband and wife, a, a man and woman coming together in marriage may have, uh, you know, certain things that they agree to do. But they need to revisit this when they become parents. Because while being parents, there could be so many additional responsibilities that's there. So being a good team means revisiting your roles, you revisiting what are responsibilities that you may need to take on. So taking on and carrying on your part of the load really helps in building the team. Okay. Also, being a good team player means that you're not concerned if you get the recognition or not the recognition goes to the team, right? Maybe someone does something well, but it is because someone has allowed that kind of a support. Probably, you know, one, uh, one um, member of the, of the team, uh, you know, um, is getting a promotion. And that is probably because the other person, the other spouse 
has been willing to um, you know maybe let go of certain of their priorities so that the other person can have uh, something met at that season of life so there needs to be a place where um, uh, you know the, the credit or the recognition actually team and an individual member so being able to share in the strength of of another and supporting each other through the weaknesses is again a way of how you find a good husband and wife team okay uh, i'm going to look at uh, quite briefly of what are some attitudes for teamwork in marriage um, we we've seen from scripture that there are specifically two main attitudes when uh, which is essential while you are in the part of a team when you're looking at the context of marriage okay and the two um, attitudes is having a servant heart and uh, being mutually submissive to one another having a servant heart and being mutually submissive to one another so when we look at scripture and i think i'll ask somebody to read uh, this is in page 103 103 um, matthew chapter 20 25 to 28 uh, and philippians 2 3 and 4 would someone take turns to read those two verses please Matthew 20, 25 to 28, and Philippians 2, 3 to 4. Ma'am, shall I read Matthew? Sure, go, go on, Rupa. Please go ahead. Matthew 20, 25 to 28. So Jesus got them together to settle things down. He said, you have observed how godless rulers throw their weight around. How quickly a little power goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for the many who are held host hostage. Thank you. Thank you, Rupa. So if you see, uh, I'll just take up some part of that verse and then maybe someone can follow it up with Philippians 2, 3 and 4. So if you see, Jesus talks about how um, in order to become great, one needs to be a servant. In order to become first, you need to be a servant. So uh, what we, and you, you do see the example of Jesus, of how Jesus showed us the example of washing the disciples' feet, and he brings that up later and says, you know, this is a pattern that, that is there that I have for you, and follow that, you know, do what I have I have asked you to do. So even though I'm leading, you know, I am showing you the way, yet I still continue being a servant. So what we, okay, would someone read Philippians 2, 3, and 4, and then we will, we will just get into a quick uh, understanding of that. Philippians yeah. 2. Ma'am, is it Philippians yeah. second chapter? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Fulfill you may my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Susan. All right, so what again it talks of here is be humble towards one another, considering others better than yourselves. You're considering others better than you, and you're looking out for the interests of the other person, which means you are placing yourself in a place of humility and looking at the interests of one another. So, uh, you know, when we when we look at the role of the husband and wife, even as the husband is the head of the home, he is also called to be a servant. He's also called to be a servant. And this is also true, both uh, is also true of the wife as well. It's, it's not, um, uh, you know, that the husband leads like Christ. Yes, but it is also where we, where even the wives are called to be 
um, to be like a servant, to look into the interests of the husband. So both needing to have the servant heart and be able to serve more than looking to be served. Okay, so that the, the example, like we said, we saw in Matthew is following what the Lord said, is to wash one another's feet, even though it, it may be uh, uh, something you, uh, uh, so it's not just about physically, um, you know, washing your husband's or your wife's feet, but doing something that probably has not been easily taken on um, by you, something which caused sacrifice, something that requires um, some sense of a humility, maybe things that you've probably never done before in your paternal home maybe you've never washed the toilet or the um you know never done any form of a cleaning or anything that seemed um unpleasant to do but uh, you having a servant heart willing to sacrifice um maybe a, a game or maybe a movie rather than that doing something showing uh, uh, and exhibiting a servant heart so one of the one of the most important attitudes is to have a servant heart like how Jesus bought his example. Okay. The second one is being mutually submissive to one another. If someone could read Ephesians 5, 21, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, please. Is everybody awake? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, uh, Avni. Go ahead. Ephesians Go 5 ahead, says, Submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. Amen. Okay, amen. So well, we've looked in the roles where we've seen that one of the, uh, how the Bible brings about the role of a wife uh, as submitting to her husband, we see in Ephesians 5.21, it calls for a mutual submission. It says to uh, be in submission to one another. Why? Out of reverence for Christ, out of your love and out of your fear of the Lord. So what does this mean? This means that even if the husband is the head of the home, probably making, um, you know, playing a, 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 the primary role in making decisions and doing things, or being willing to discuss um, ideas, take on ideas, take on certain decisions that um, the wife has has brought about as uh, as good and as going ahead with a plan is something that we look at mutual submission. So where you are willing <clears throat> to submit to one another, to yield to one another. Why? Because the outcome is the best of the marriage. Not that as, as the head of the home or as a helper of the home, I'm not supposed to be you know, allowing this, but then we've been called to yield to one another, to submit to one another because of reverence. Like we said, you know, we we um, we saw that each of us, uh, in as God's children, have different giftings, have different things that God's given us, maybe different strengths. So something that the wife may be uh, having a stronger strength in, probably the husband does and vice versa. But being willing to learn from each other, to submit uh, to to having, uh, in this case, the husband submitting to take on maybe something the wife has said, which seems like a good plan. So the two heart attitudes, servant, be, having a servant heart and being mutually submissive is is the key. Are these essential heart characters that we need to develop as we uh, uh, work together in being a team. Okay, Now we're going to be looking at what does it look like to become a kingdom team. Uh, now a kingdom, I think a kingdom team happens only when you've married somebody in the Lord. Okay, so the goal in the kingdom team is to support, encourage and empower each other to fulfill what God has uh, ordained for you. Okay, so the goal in the kingdom team is to support, to encourage, and empower each other by 
fulfilling what God has given for them. Okay, and here um, the the husband and the wife become a team together only if they are able to see what are those purposes that um, they need to fulfill together through their lives, maybe as individuals, as well as together as a family. So uh, the purpose is only to extend the kingdom of God. So whatever that takes for the two people to come together um, uh, is what needs to be done because there is a specific purpose. It's not a selfish interest. It is not a man-made outcome. It is not something that you, your, your individuality is increased. It is for the purpose of the kingdom of God. So we do see that when, when we've, uh, you know, earlier we did see in chapter one where uh, God, brought the man and the woman to become one it is for a purpose and uh, we uh, we see that it it just does not benefit one person but it benefits benefits the marriage but it benefits maybe a larger family it benefits a, a you know a church it benefits maybe a certain community and that is what um, you are called. So when God brings you together to be one, he has also called you all to be one for a purpose. And when we see the, uh, you know, when we look at the Genesis commission, it says to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill, to conquer and to rule uh, the earth. Uh, that, that's what the commission has been given. And this has been given to both the man and the woman. And both the husband and wife see this as a responsibility of taking on the rule and the reign of God in their lives and being able to extend it to, to that which is outside. We do see that becoming one for a purpose um, is also as a result uh, uh, from the standing that the husband and the wife are joint as. Um, in the kingdom, as it's seen in First Peter three seven, we're joint heirs in the kingdom. So, just uh, because we are joint heirs, you know, when when you uh, you know, if you have a brother or a sister, and there are there's an inheritance given to you, everything that your parents have left to you belongs to the two of you. So similarly, when you when you know that you are joint heirs in the kingdom, everything that the kingdom has, or every privilege that the kingdom has uh, has offered to you is is for both of you whether it's in the gifting or it is in the calling or it is in the anointing or if it is in the value we need to pursue god's purposes ensuring that we are supporting each other the husband and wife support each other to release and fulfill the purposes of god Okay, now even as we understand that we are one for a purpose, we also need to discover our own individual callings and vocation. So uh, if you look in scripture, there are places, you know, in Romans as well as in 1 Corinthians, it talks of how God has set the members in the body because each of them have a function. So similarly, the husband and the wife also do have a place or an individual standing in the body of Christ, depending on their strengths or depending on their anointing. So let's say you know you have a couple who's um, who's in in the in a, you know working together. Maybe there is the husband who is um, who teaches, who is able to teach and bring the word of God in truth. To the um, to to maybe a community, whereas the wife probably is a uh, maybe is a better administrator and and able to uh, work in administrative purposes. So knowing what it is that God has individually called you for, and also being able to encourage each other to discover that calling, rather than having one person or the or either of you being fitting into the calling uh, that they may not be designed to be right so uh, learning to understand that um, god has given each one of us an individual calling but we can still work together even those those callings and that's that's what we talk about blending you blend your callings and your vocation together so that the purposes of god can be fulfilled so that your calling can be fulfilled not just as a couple but also individually so while you're doing that you're 
um, you're keeping in mind that that there is that uh, you're respecting also maybe the the needs and the uh, you know gifting and the calling that god has put on your spouse's life you are respecting that and allowing them to grow rather than it being a cause of contention or being a bone of contention between the two so discovering what those personal callings are and being willing to encourage and support each other through those um, through the uh, through that specific calling that that each of them may have okay um, and as uh, so I think something that I'd like to bring bring here is, um, um, you know, we're working together as a team, um, which I had made reference to earlier, can in different seasons um, change. So maybe you know when y'all are when 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 a husband and wife is a young couple, there may be many more pers um, common pursuits or common goals that they can work together. Right, but as they are in a different season, maybe like a season of childbearing, where there is, um, you know, children comes along the way, uh, so there, there, there may not be one person may not be able to um, uh, take on maybe their personal calling for that specific uh, season. Maybe let's say in this case, a wife who is uh, who is a new mother requires a lot more time to be with the children, with the babies, so that, um, you know, there can be some form of growth that happens in that life. So uh, understanding that every season, um, each the husband and the wife supports each other and comes to a place of communicating what uh, what new roles they would have in in a current season so it is important to be able to encourage and support the other through these different seasons of life and as they may as you make these transitions being willing to help one another so i remember when um, you know when we were very young parents that we had you know young children uh, my husband had just got into the worship ministry and uh, we our children are only three years apart and uh, it used to get very difficult to uh, you know to uh, to manage both of them together especially when you're coming to church you have a, a little kid crying and then you have the next one who is you know just with you um, so there was a certain time that we had to you know uh, reprioritize certain things so that we could work together as a team but then when things got a little better when the children became a little more manageable then uh, you know there was uh, we, we began to help each other and we began to share some some of those responsibilities or or even you know release um, some the other to do the calling or to do what God had called them to do and maybe one person probably had to take on a little bit more of extra work and uh, you know extra stress but but that was understood that that was a way that you work together in a team okay even uh, through these seasons ensuring that you know uh, you do not impose um, uh, any kind of uh, not not imposing anything that they you may be personally experiencing in your in your life on the other person so being willing to stand by with them in in the pace that they are going going through so that you know you can build and support them through their difficult challenges and difficult uh, times okay and through these seasons always ensuring that you are there as their cheerleader to be able to help them in their growth and uh, uh, whatever god's doing in their lives Okay, uh, quickly, I'm just going to stop again for a few minutes to see if any of you have any questions. The class has been awfully quiet today. Madam, the class is very interesting. Uh, it requires, I us, it requires, yeah, it requires us to pay a serious attention because when it comes to marriage. <laughs> It is something that nobody knows it all. And then there's some mistakes, you know, you make and you just wonder, how did I make that mistake? Hmm. So for me right now, you know, listening to what you're teaching us is just something that's so amazing. And the words of wisdom I hear, 
the words of wisdom I hear is just something that you know that can help me really build a better home. Because you know, I, you. I believe that I believe that marriage, you know, represents the kingdom of God. It's a reflection of God's kingdom. And when we don't pay attention to it, it becomes becomes a problem to the society. And that's how I see it. And when it comes to you know unity in the home, when it comes to how you know the one I got mostly is the is the one the competition in marriage. Just competition in marriage, you know, it's something that I've experienced, you know, where it's more like you know you're competing, you know, with your spouse or with your partner. Mm -hmm. And in those moments, you know, you're asking yourself, what exactly are you competing for? But by the grace of God, you know, it, it brought us to a point, you know, where we got to see that there is something God has deposited in each and every one of us that is unique, you know, to making that home, you know, be what it ought to be. You know, I use my gifts you know, as a man and, she, and my wife, you know, uses her gifts as a woman. And when we come together, you know, to make that gift, you know, function in the home, it becomes a tool, you know, for expanding the kingdom of God. And that's why listening to you is just something that has just blessed me this morning. And I want to say thank you and God bless. Thank you, Harrison. I'm so glad to hear that, uh, yeah, praise God that he brings his word uh, duly and timely to each of us. Okay, thank you. All right, so if there aren't any questions, I think I'll move forward. Okay, so, uh, yes, someone's written a question. Uh, it is really true about discovering and valuing the strengths of your partner, especially in ministry for God. No matter how Sorry, apologies. I think my my connection went off for a bit. Okay, I'm I'm back. All right. Okay. Uh, as we move on, I think there's some there is a warning that um, uh, we need to pay attention to, especially for those of us who may be on the front line of a church or a Christian ministry. Um, you know, very often we, we do see that, uh, you know, when there is one of the members um, of the family, either the husband or the wife, is um, engaging in some kind of a ministry, especially in the kind of ministry that that's maybe more... Um, uh, you know, more more in, in public view. When I mean by public view, I'm saying things where they're up in the forefront, either to teach or to preach or to, or as a worship uh, leader or a worship pastor. Um, often the expectation is that the other spouse and the children should be in a certain way or do certain things, you know. 
and I've seen that a lot of times there is a lot of pressure in the way that uh, um, um, that maybe it's it's uh, the members or or a congregation or other people ask that you know why isn't the other spouse involved and i remember seeing this in my home church uh you know the church that i came from that um, and you know i was in a traditional system but nevertheless the pastors would you know um they would come they would minister in rotation so there was a certain amount of time that they ministered like they were there for three years or five years together so every time that we used to have different new pastors uh, you know rotating over different congregations so uh, and a lot of the a lot of the men are the pastors but the women generally uh, at least in the tradition church that I was in women were not pastors but they were they had to assume some form of ministry you know and usually it would the women's ministry is pushed to the to the wife uh, of the pastor and i remember in our time there was one such couple where the where the wife of the pastor wasn't she was never led to do women's ministry she was led for children's ministry and the and the kind of um, battles she went through because you there is an expectation that the wife of the pastor must fit into this kind of a box so, so i think that's that's a big warning sign for us to be true to what god has put in our heart so when god has called us for something he wants us to fulfill our role or uh, you know our place in what he has called us to do shay i'll i will reach to you in two seconds i'll just finish this point and i'll give you a chance to ask your question so um it is important that we do not do things uh, for the sake of pleasing people around or for the sake of fitting into the expectations of others and um, you know being either hypocritical there shouldn't be a hypocritical gap in knowing that you should be doing something but actually doing something else so we are not called to live uh, according to people's expectations but we are called to be examples according to what God, um, God's word says. So, uh, so when you know that you love God and you would want to obey him and being led by the Holy Spirit, your objective is to serve God wherever he has called you to do and not to do it because um, you know, the, the larger congregation or people expect you to be in that. So uh, this is specifically true of ministers or those of us who are in ministry. I remember this, uh, you know, so I'm a, I'm a counselor and I, and, and I, I largely uh, um, work among people. And so once I was in this setting of pastors, we were doing a workshop for the pastors on marriage and family. And it was me and a colleague of mine who's also a woman so he came to us who's a pastor he came to us and he approached us and he said a family ministry is uh, you know you cannot do a family ministry if you you can't teach in a family ministry if your husband is not here with you and uh, you know i i sweetly uh, he was an elderly pastor you know i sweetly said you know my husband has a different calling um, but whenever there is need of a support he is there with me but uh, you know we do not have to live a pretense life but do and go according to what god has called us to do because he makes that beautiful you know and sometimes i've seen that just my husband and i when we go together to minister he's a worship leader but i i do a lot i'm i'm more into encouraging into one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling and as and as well as within the ministry of marriage and family uh, you know god equips us at that time and couples come to us uh, and you know or you know there are times that i lead worship alongside with him i mean not in church but you know in smaller settings and he ministers aside with me when we are with marriage and family so don't be under the pressure of living hypocritically or for public view, do what God has called you to do. Yes, I'm opening this out to Shay and Harrison both have opened, uh, have raised hands. Shay, uh, we'll go with you first. Yes, ma. Thank you, ma. I just want you to speak to this. I find nowadays, um, and this is not to discredit 
those couples who have decided to to preach i mean to to serve you know as pastors or shepherds of our flock but i find out these days is that the wives are kind of always compelled just because the husband is a pastor then they try to kind of decorate the wives you know to occupy an office just because by proxy she's married to the pastor and i'm just wondering um i believe at the end of the day if a wife is going to take the office of a pastor is that she also has a genuine call you know to be a pastor but it's like there's this pressure that you know once you're married to a pastor you have to become a pastor so I, I would just like you to just speak on that i for me i believe that the wife also too should have a genuine call that oh yes you know i would like to be a pastor but if she doesn't she can always just support in any capacity she can support her husband but not saying oh i'm going to take the office of a pastor you know and then so i just like you to speak on that really because some people make that mistake and they end up putting their wives under pressure you know getting them into trouble that would have just been avoided if there was an understanding you know in the beginning yeah absolutely shay i think you you just resounded the point that i just made that uh, to be able to engage in ministry alongside with your spouse all because they have taken on a specific calling uh, do not be pressured into that unless and until like you said god has called you in for for that and um, so we we know uh, we don't want to live for in order to fit into a uh, uh, social expectation but to be in a place where god has called because we will be effective only if we follow uh, the calling of god in the gifting that he has given us so yes you uh, you just uh, um echoed what we were talking about a few minutes ago so shay you you are right that we free um in this case pastors wives to take on the calling that um god wants them to do like you know i i've seen very many times that uh pastors wives have been called to preach um you know just because their husbands have preached and uh it it is a great task for them and <clears throat> of course they don't seem to be called for that so freeing them of that i think is our responsibility you know not ensuring that our attitudes towards pastoral um teams or pastoral ministry is that whatever god has called them for that's what where they will flourish and that's where the anointing will be so as maybe people of the congregation i think it's our responsibility also to change our mindsets yes uh, harrison thank you pa thank you pastor thank you shay yes harrison thank you um and um thank you shay for that um question you know because it's still something that bothers me sometimes and also um looking at the continent in that i come from it is becoming impossible for you to talk to a pastor or ministers when they are doing something that is not in line you know, with the word of God. And I want you to speak on this um, issue that I want to raise up. Now, there are things you know, I've observed in my local church, and not just in the one that I'm in now, but some other churches that have gone to where you know the pastor seems to have a very close relationship you know with the women than the men that you know it's just like you know when Shay mentioned you know where if a if a woman is married to a pastor she's compelled to like you know want to take up a responsibility you know to meet up you know to those um expectations you know, of a pastor but one thing I believe too is that, as as a pastor's wife, at least there should be there should be a close relationship, you know, with the pastor's wife and the women, and more of the ladies too in the church. So it's more like you know, 
I see a pastor that is not having any relationship, you know, with the men, but rather having relationship, you know, with the women and occupying, you know, responsibilities, giving responsibilities, you know, to the women more than the men. And I've seen situations, you know, where it, it, it becomes a point, you know, where a pastor can exalt a man's wife in front of his husband or in front of her husband. And, you know, that, you know, bring, you know, that sparks up a feeling, you know, to like, what is going on here? And at some point, you know, it, it bothers me a lot. And when I, when I spoke about um, competition, competition, you know, comes mostly when we do ministry. Where, okay, the husband, you know, is capable of doing this. And the wife is capable of doing this. And it's more like, okay, everybody's trying to see that, okay, I'm the best, you know, in this. I'm the best in that. And um, at the end of the day, you miss the real reason, you know, why God has called you. And it's very important, you know, for us to know who we are as Christians and know our giftings. So that, you know, we don't, you know, go to and fro, you know, maybe when the wind, you know, blows to the side, you know, we, we swing to that side. Or it blows to that side and we swing to that side. We really need to know because, you know, why I'm saying this is that I'm not just saying this based on, the, um, based on what I've seen. I've also experienced it where you become so furious, you know, with um, the kind of activities, you know, you see. And it wants to make you incompetent, you know, on what you know best or what you know how to do. And it took me a while, you know, for me to come into that revelation, you know, to know that, okay, I'm not in this world, you know, to compete with anybody, but rather to stick to the purpose or to stick to what God, you know, has called me to do. So I want to, like, you know, see how you throw more light, you know, to to ministries, you know, where it looks as if, you know, everything is one-sided, where a pastor will be exalting a um, man's wife in front of the men, you know, making the men, you know, looks as if, you know, they're incompetent. So I just want to, I want to hear more on this. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison, for your question. Okay, um, uh, uh, you know, so these are, yes, practical challenges that we see among, uh, uh, among churches and in ministry. Mm, um, so I'm going to try and put as much uh, understanding as I can into this answer. But I also think that even as we move into through this course, we have a chapter that talks about boundaries. And that chapter will definitely throw a lot more light on, on this. Although it talks about boundaries between a husband and wife, we still can um, take many principles of that in a ministering husband and wife. Um, so one of the things that I think is very important for especially those of us who are in ministry is to have accountability. Um, and where there is no accountability, everything seems probably to be free flowing. That And when it comes from one head or one leader, there isn't anyone to really question uh, motives, question intentions, question actions. So a ministry where it is just a one leader um, setting uh, often can face struggles similar to this. So I think my first answer would be there needs to be accountability um, of the leaders to either other pastors, other elders, to help in engaging, supervising different activities and actions of the church. Okay, The second point that I want to bring about is, um, as a rule, and I, I want to bring about something we're saying, uh, you know, as, as part of what we follow at APC, is as a rule, 
um, apart from a counselor, a professional counselor meeting with an individual, like for example, a female counselor meeting with a male member, apart from a counseling relationship, every kind of pastoral work is done in the presence um, of the other spouse as well. So if it is a pastor meeting with a woman, it is done in the presence of the husband as well. Uh, unless, like I said, it is for um, uh, counseling that goes to uh, specifically counselors. So that is another practice that is that's put in place that um, that there is a, a code or an a, or a statement of understanding that um, pastors would not engage or counsel. Um, members of, uh, you know, of the opposite sex without the presence of their own spouse or, you know, sharing of information. There may be times like, you know, someone calls someone, uh, you know, uh, let's say a member, uh, a, a woman would probably walk into the office to meet with a pastor. Yes, but it is in full view of the rest of the members of the church. And there is, uh, you know, a um, permission taken from the woman to involve the husband in cases of that. So there are some of those boundaries that need to be put in place because that builds up with accountability. And once, um, you know, that is spoken, that is addressed to a team uh, of ministers, uh, you know, following that is something um, that we ensure uh, it being done. So this is a way that I can address these two, but I think I will like to throw a lot more light as we go into the chapter of boundaries, because it does talk of practical measures of how even pastors or those in ministry or even even just being a common minister, um, you know, each of us are believers and ministers, even being just a common believer needs to um, hold fast too. So we will be doing that in length at the uh, at the chapter on boundaries. Um, I hope that I know that doesn't completely answer your question. But I hope to do that as we move into our next uh, uh, into into that chapter. All right. Okay, uh, quickly, um, just to wrap up, there are certain things that even as we are looking at um, working as a as a couple, for kingdom purposes. Um, the, the first and foremost thing that I think often mm, ministers sometimes uh, overlook is that there are specific priorities that come before their ministry. So if you are to look at um, a, a priority or a hierarchy, the home and the family comes before the ministry. And I think one of the biggest challenges that ministers do face is learning how to balance all of this, the home, the marriage, the home, the family, and um, managing uh, ministry. And let's say if there are people who are volunteering, they have an extra additional thing like work also. So balancing home, balancing work, and as well as balancing ministry. So uh, it is important to understand that there is a certain priority that God has set, okay? And uh, in, in any form of work that a, ministry, that a couple does is, is first and foremost, is their relationship with God. Secondly, it is their relationship at home with their spouses and their children. Thirdly, is their uh, you know, the, the ministry that, that has been given to them. And often a lot of people mix up these priorities and tend to serve or, or be so compelled in being within ministry that things that their relationship with God and their relationship with their core family is forgotten. So balancing these priorities within your calling is crucial and knowing what these priorities also are. Okay, we're uh, just going to quickly end as to two most powerful areas where a husband and wife team works. The first one 
is in prayer, as we saw in Matthew 18, 19 to 20, that when two agree about anything to pray, it will be done by the Father in heaven. So one of the most powerful things that a husband and wife can do together as a team is come together to build the family altar, is coming together in prayer, setting a time for prayer and for worship and for learning the word. And uh, this uh, becomes the, the, the bloodline, uh, sorry, not the, 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 the blood, you know, the actual uh, way, the veins through which a family functions and grows. So prayer is one of the most effective things that a husband and wife can do together. And I know that becomes a huge challenge for very many Christian homes coming together in prayer, um, especially conflicting homes where they find ha it hard to come together to just worship God because a lot of times their differences are, uh, you know, about the word or about doctrines. I know multiple number of families who struggle because both the husband and the wife have different understanding of what the word talks about. And as a result, prayer gets affected. Or certain notions and perceptions of prayer often keeps families away from engaging in that. But as God's word says, it is only prayer that brings people together, that brings God's reign and rule and answer to us. So prayer is one thing that the family does, uh, that the husband and wife does together as a team. And the second thing is bringing up children. Because you're not just bringing up individuals, you're building a legacy. You're building uh, generation after generations. So unless it is done together, done in common, done with, uh, um, with, with, with instructions from the word of God, from standards of the word of God, um, it becomes a challenge bringing up children in this age and time, in, in this season and in this life that we are in here. To, kn to know that it is a commission that God has given us, right? Be fruitful, be, mu uh, be fruitful and multiply, right? We keep that in mind as we nurture and train the children because we are building disciples within our homes first and foremost. If as parents, as husband and wives, as father and mother, if we are not taking on our core responsibility of building disciples, establishing disciples in our home, our work outside becomes null and void. And what does that mean, becoming uh, making disciples of children? Is to help them follow the way of the Lord, to build them, to bring them up in the discipline of the Lord, to bring them up uh, with with uh, uh, with with the knowledge of God, to bring them up and build their emotional maturity, to stand as support and encouragement and help on them, help uh, to them. So these two things, prayer and in nurturing and bringing up children. Now, both these two, we will be speaking in much detail uh, in, the, in the sections to come. But this chapter completely just highlights that as a team, these two things are very powerful because one, as we pray together, you know, we change nations. And when we bring up children as disciples, we're building a future generation of God's kingdom. They are God's kingdom right within our homes. All right. Okay. So today we covered quite a bit and I know this is quite intense and maybe repetitive too, but nevertheless, it still has the truth of God's word um, that unity has blessing and life in it. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. I think we've gone five minutes extra. Uh, would somebody please close with a word of prayer? Uh, is Manji there? Can I request you to pray. Okay. 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 Uh, let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we we are grateful, Lord. We are grateful for your grace and your love and your kindness, Jesus, that you you keep on sharing us, you keep on guiding us, you keep on with your tender hands and your you even though you are mighty, Lord, you you still soften us, you still lower yourself to the level that we can understand you, we can see you in the way that we our mind can grasp. And we thank you, Jesus, for this institution of marriage you've given us. You, you've made us know you, understand you, and know how to, how to, to walk with you through the marriage you've given us, Lord. And we pray, Jesus, as we, we learn more about marriage, let not be about our physical marriage, but let also be about our marriage with you, our interaction with you, and how we, we respond to you and how we walk in your, in, in your ways. We thank you, Jesus, for your love and your kindness. Be with us, Lord, until we meet again. In your mighty name, Father, we pray. In, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. A reminder for all those who haven't completed your assessments, please do it by end of day. Right? Thank you very much. God bless. And we'll meet you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you.